companies out there which are owned by one or two uh, shareholders or owners. And they have a lot of wealth invested in their business. So they're exposed to both idiosyncratic and aggregate shocks. And what I'm interested in is what are the implications for optimal tax policy. So this has been done before by, uh, for me, the most closely related papers, uh, Panusian rates. And in there, they study uh, an optimal taxation problem with uh, idiosyncratic investment risk with IID shocks in continuous time. And therefore, um, uh, unless the shocks are extremely large, they find large tax subsidies. And the intuition for that is this. Basically, uh, with idiosyncratic investment risk, uh, firm, you have an incentive to undersave on the part of the firms, because when they invest in their own firm, they're facing the extra risk associated with that investment. And to counteract that, the government wants to uh, subsidize capital to encourage investment. And this is sort of similar to the result of Ayagari's work, where if there's oversaving because of the, uh, if there's oversaving due to incomplete markets, you want to tax capital, and if, you, if there's undersaving, you want to subsidize capital. And now in this paper, what I do is I include persistence in the idiosyncratic risk. And I find when that happens, you get large capital taxes. And the reason for that essentially is that the uh, taxes are providing insurance. So there's a trade-off here. There is undersaving, and there's also insurance. When you have IID risk in continuous time, the insurance motive is low. Essentially, in the long run, it dies out entirely, and you want to subsidize capital. But when there's... Uh, uh, when there's persistence risk, the insurance made motive stays large, and you want to have large capital taxes. I also get some implications for labor income taxes, and this is, uh, I find this result interesting, because in previous work, there's kind of an obvious reason you tax labor. There's uh, heterogeneous labor productivities, and you, if you have a planet who puts weights on all agents, he's going to want to tax labor to uh, subsidize the agents who have low labor productivities. Here I kind of have a counterintuitive result. There's no labor income risk. But at the same time, the planner wants us to have large labor taxes. And the reason for this is that I have this idiosyncratic investment risk, which is causing the distribution of assets to spread out over the time due to incomplete markets. And the planner ends up wanting to tax labor to essentially decrease the value of those assets, the financial market assets, the bonds. And this can lead to a large uh, labor tax in the long run. So uh, essentially the intuition is that labor taxes are reducing the interest rates on, on bonds. And now I'll go into more detail on that uh, later on. This paper has also sort of a methodological contribution. This is not an easy problem. I'm solving this in incomplete markets as a distribution of state variables which is evolving over time. And the way I do this, I use a variant of perturbation methods where essentially I'm uh, changing the, I'm using a sequence of local approximations to approximate the global solution. And this has some nice features. It allows me to handle a substantial amount of heterogeneity. It's applicable to a range of problems. And Mo is going to be presenting next on a paper we also use this. And, uh, it also is quite flex, it, 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 it to some extent uh, deals with the curse of dimensionality. The, uh, the number, the uh, computational time grows linearly with the number of agents, even for higher order approximations. So there's a lot of related literature, I'll just quickly go over this. Uh, the, of course, the Chamley Judd results, and I should really put Werning's paper up there too. There's a sort of a classic zero taxation result. Of course, I'm going to be finding non-zero taxes in this paper, which is not overly surprising due to the fact that there's incomplete markets. Again, the closest paper I have is Panusian rice. And there's a, a large literature, there's a, a perturbation theory has been applied to heterogeneous agents models in various, uh, various forms. I'm, I'll highlight the differences when I get to that. So let's start with the model. It's going to be a fairly simple model. There's going to be a continuum of ex ante identical agents. Uh, they're going to supply labor to a global labor market for which they'll receive a wage WT. They'll invest in their own firm, and they'll also trade a risk-free bond. The agents are going to start off ex ante identical. They're going to have the same initial productivities and initial capital. And this is essentially because I want to make the time zero problem really easy to solve. But at time zero, the planner is not going to want to institute any taxes, because there's no differences between the individuals. 
The timeline is kind of is pretty common with these uh, investment risk models. At time t minus one, the agents are going to invest a certain amount of capital. Come time t, the shocks are going to arrive. They're going to observe the shocks. They're allowed to change the labor supply, uh, labor hired, and to choose also the labor supply. They then consume and then they invest again. So. Because I'm going to have persistent risk in the uh, productivities of these, uh, in these, of these firms, uh, I'm going to use a decreasing scale production function. This basically ensures that the uh, decreasing return to scale production function. This basically ensures that one firm doesn't end up completely dominating the, the market. The productivity is going to be a combination of a uh, persistent shock new and a idiosyncratic shock, uh, an IID shock epsilon t. This new is going to follow an AR1 process. Now, because of how I'm going to be approximating this, I'm going to have uh, new close to one, uh, sorry, this row close to one, and I'm going to sort of vary the overall, the effective autocorrelation by varying the relative variances of these shocks. That's something which is not ideal, and in the future I'm going to be able to, uh, to relax that. So the profits of the firm are going, they're going to be a function of the, of the uh, firm's current capital level, the, uh, its own idiosyncratic productivity, and the wage level of the economy. And additionally, the uh, labor hired by the firm is going to be a function of those objects as well. Yeah? Why do you need two different shops there? Uh, I'm uh, uh, sorry. I'll, I'll say that again. The idea is that I want I want to very I want to get an idea of how the economy changes as I change the overall autocorrelation of the shock process, and the way I'm going to be approximating the model. I need this row close to one. No, I understand. But why do you need two epsilon? Yeah. So if because the row is close to one, if I want to change the autocorrelation, I do that by changing the relative variance of the idiosyncratic of the yeah, sorry the IID shock. See, the epsilon, the, the epsilon, yeah, the epsilon t, t here, and the the other epsilon. Supposing epsilon tau is zero. Supposing epsilon tau is zero, then the autocorrelation will always be wrong. Oh, I see. Okay. So the agent's problem is simple. It's just going to choose uh, consumption, labor, uh, capital, and bond holdings to maximize its. Uh, uh, time zero utility subject to a budget constraint. And now we can see the, the instruments the planner has here. It's going to have a proportional tax on capital income, a proportional tax on labor income, and also a lump sum tax it can use to help redistribute. Uh, the timing of this is, the, the, the setup of this is such that you, there's some flexibility between the total distribution of assets, the, the lump sum tax. So what I'll do is I'll uh, essentially solve a problem where the lump sum tax at time, at time zero is basically used to help, uh, solve the, help, help deal with the government's initial debt and to redistribute future taxation. And then from time one onwards, it's going to set that lump sum tax to zero. Is that, that's part of the outcome? That's part of the outcome. I, well, so let, let's sort of be actually. That's a I good. Mean, isn't it kind of odd to have lump sum taxes and distortionary taxes? And if you think that there's lump sum taxes, then why do you need two lump sum taxes? Well, that's interesting. Not if there's multiple agents. If there's multiple agents, lump sum taxes are going to be problematic. I have some agents who have low wealth, and I have some agents who have a lot of wealth. The if I, if I in the end of this, if I if I then use lump sum taxes in the future, I'm going to be. Uh, I, I, I guess I should admit that intuition comes with aggregate shocks. But essentially, I am going the the lump sum taxes allow you to deal with the de, deal with the essentially the funding needs of the government. I'm not really worried about how the government is going to fund its uh, its government consumption obligations, but. I do worry about how the government is going to deal. Uh, I do worry about the inequality which this model produces. And that's where the proportional taxes are going to come in. And this gives them a, gives it a way to uh, lump sum return those taxes back to the individuals. It's essentially a way of redistribution. If I were to plot the effective tax, if, if, I, if I, I could have an if I looked at the average tax, it would be different than the marginal tax for individuals. 
Maybe I don't know the literature that well. It seems like if you had a full set of lump sum taxes available, you'd be able to redistribute. Them okay. Them yeah. If I if I had an, if I was, only this particular. Yeah. Region. Yeah. I'm basically approximating. I'm trying. Okay. I'm, I'm approximating this of possibly a more curved tax function just with an affine tax structure. <laughs> Uh, actually, this is flexible enough that in the future I could actually add in some curvature to the tax function as well. Yes, Mark? I'm concerned about the pressure in the labor and capital markets because the heterogeneity in the shocks suggests that there will be large differences, could be large differences in productivity between firm, cross firms. Yes. But you will not allow firm I to invest in firm J. Well, I do actually allow them. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. They, they have access to a bond. Let's say I have a low productivity firm, but I have a lot of assets. So I save those assets, and then a high productivity firm can borrow and invest in their own firm. There's actually a lot of movement of capital in this. Uh, I've tried some extensions where, I, uh, where there isn't so much, where the, it becomes more costly to borrow. As but firms pay different interest rates on the bonds? Same interest rate. So I cannot invest in a highly productive firm. Okay, yeah, you you can't uh, you can't purchase uh, stock. stock. I cannot purchase stock in no. a very highly productive firm. A firm has enormous productivity. I can't participate. Yeah, yeah. In, in this in this model, you can't do that. So, so here, if I understand right, there are no aggregate shops, right? Yeah, there's no so aggregate shops so right the now. The reduction you mentioned sort of shifting distributions. Uh, so where does that? Well, so the transition the, yeah, the, the, so the I, I, right now I'm going to be present I, in this due to time constraints I'm not going to present any results in aggregate shocks. I do also, I do also have, but even without aggregate shocks, it's still not easy to solve this model since the the distribution of state variables is still going to vary over time. And there's a path dependence to it. The result of what? Just the the idiosyncratic shocks. So it's a deterministic path. Because of the incomplete markets. Because of the incomplete markets, exactly. Yes. So there's a utilitarian planner who uh, maximizes the ex ante utility of the agents. Again, all agents are identical and at, the, in, at the beginning, but ex post the, the heterogeneous. Uh, the, the budget constraint, where the, uh, again, this is just the reflection of the agent's budget constraint. We have a proportional tax and capital income. Proportional tax and labor income and lump sum transfers, also debt. And then we have market clearing to close the economy. So the resource constraint has to clear and uh, the labor market has to clear as well. So the Ramsey problem is pretty straightforward to set up here. You want to, given a competitive equilibrium, you have a competitive equilibrium given tax policies, and then you want to find the welfare maximizing competitive equilibrium. Uh, sorry. So when we write this all down, we have the, in, oh sorry, the Ramsey problem is then given initial debt, which essentially can be dealt with the, with the lump sum transfers easily, uh, initial capital and the initial productivities of the agents. Uh, we want to maximize the ex ante utility subject to individual constraints and aggregate constraints. So the reason I, I'm going to be more clear about why I'm splitting this up, but essentially you have the constraints which deal with the individual maximization problem of the agent. So we have the budget constraints, the Euler equation with respect to the risk-free bond, the Euler equation representing investing in capital, and the labor leisure choice. And then we have aggregate constraints which basically uh, have to hold across agents. So simply the, the resource constraints, the uh, labor supply, and then the total supply of capital has to add up to the aggregate capital sum. And we're gonna, I'm gonna exploit that symmetry later to sort of, to uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the comp the, uh, to reduce the, to, to make the problem more computationally tractable. So before I get into this, let me just sort of do some broad notation. I'm not going to switch over, describe how I'm going to solve this in a sort of general way, and then we'll see how the solution works out, what happens in, when I solve this particular problem. So we'll have uh, individual choices, which are uh, yi. We'll have some policy variables chosen by the Ramsey problem, which are capital y. So the difference between these is that some depend on the individual and some don't. These are sort of aggregate variables. 
then we have individual states, zi, aggregate states, and some parameters of the model. In this case, the parameters are just going to be row. So the individual variables are going to be things like consumption, labor supplied, labor hired, capital, bond holdings, and the aggregate variables are going to be uh, the total stock of capital, the tax rates, transfers, bonds. The states here are going to be uh, a distribution over individual states, the normalized marginal utility of the inverse marginal utility of the agent. This is essentially keeping track of the uh, distribution of consumption, keeping track of the, pro of the commitments to, uh, to uh, bond pricing. The multiplier on the, uh, on the agent's budget constraints mu, and the persistent component of productivity. On top of that, we have the aggregate capital stock and essentially the level of uh, marginal utility in the previous period. So this distribution is going to be evolving over time as well as the aggregate variables as well. So what I'm going to after here is I'm going to stack up these constraints of the individual constraints, which were the, uh, those constraints I showed in the previous problem, plus the, uh, the, uh, the first order conditions with respect to the individual variables, consumption, labor, uh, et cetera. And we have aggregate constraints, which are the, uh, the, the aggregate uh, the resource clearing, the, sorry, the resource constraints, labor market clearing constraints, and also first order conditions with respect to the aggregate variables. And I want to find a recursive solution to this. So I want to find individual choices, which are a function of the individual shocks, epsilon, the aggreg possibly aggregate shocks, theta. Can you, can you, can you <coughs> yeah. So, can you walk the gamma, the distribution? It's the distribution over the individual states. And that's the infinite dimensional object. Yeah, that's an infinite dimensional object. Okay. Or finite dimensional if there's a finite number of agents. So I want to find an approximation for the individual choices, which are a function of the, their own individual shocks, the aggregate shocks, their individual state, the aggregate uh, state, the distribution of, across individual states and the uh, level of capital. And also, they're going to be a function of the variances of the individual shocks and the, this parameter row of the persistence. Similarly, the aggregate, choice, the aggregate choices of the planner are going to be a function of pretty much the same objects, but not the individual uh, states of the agent themselves, just the aggregate states. I want to compute the laws of motions for the individual states and the aggregate states. This is big problem, there's some big objects in here. So the idea is I'm going to basically be approximating these with a sequence of local approximations. So apply perturbation theory, I need a steady state. And I'm going to do this such that I'm going to choose the persistence of that shock such that uh, the individual, uh, any distribution of individual states is a steady state. So. I choose a row, it's, it, when we it, it take the limit as row goes to one, and the shocks go to zero. The distribution of the uh, uh, individual states will remain constant. Essentially, the, the market weights are going to be constant, essentially like complete markets. Then the, uh, the multipliers, you can show, will remain constant over time. And the, the, uh, taking the limit as row goes to one, so the productivities will be constant. So then we have this sort of an idea for the optimum. So, so the state state's not unique, I guess. No, it's not unique. Would it make a difference if you use one versus another? Uh, they're kind of all the same. They're all the same, but I have one which is closest to where I am right now. Okay. Essentially, I'm taking the one which is closest to where I am right now. So the idea is I come in with a distribution gamma and an aggregate state zt minus one. Given the get distribution gamma, I solve for its associated steady state. So the level of z associated with the steady state for that distribution, and the level of the aggregate variables, and the individual cho the, the, the choice for each individual agent. So this would be something like the economy already has the right level of capital or something. Uh, You're not transitioning toward higher capital. Lord. You will be transitioning when I turn on shocks, right. but at this point, you're not transitioning. This is the point where 
you you so it's sort of like you solved a complete markets problem with uh, you've solved a problem where there's no there's no risk, and you've let the capital level sort of converge to its uh, converge to the steady state level. Right. So that should be the right level of capital, in some sense, for the economy. So you wouldn't want to have some policy that would knock you off that level of capital. Yeah. And without but you are you are going to. I think. Yeah, transition. I'm going. I'm going to want to because uh, the the planner is going to. Well, there's going to be several things. First of all, I'm not at my my the Z I come in with is going to be different than the steady state level of Z. Yeah. And also, I'm going to be I'm going to be facing shocks, which are going to uh, change the uh, distribution in the future. Like the, the the distribution in the future is going to evolve, and I'm going to want to change my policy because of that. Okay, now the so now the shocks go away again, and now you're at a new level, different level of capital, and somehow. Yeah, let me let me walk okay. through, and then we'll we'll, we'll see if, if the question is answered, and okay. you can bug me again. All right. So, uh, given the gamma t minus one, given your current distribution of individual states, you solve for its associated non-stochastic steady state level of capital. And the non-stochastic steady state level of the, all the aggregates and the individual choices. You then approximate the decision rules via Taylor expansion. So, uh, right, I, this is the first order, but there would be second order, which would depend on the variances of the shocks as well. And it's just the second order, you don't go higher. I don't go higher. Right now. And then, Using the so here's the first order. So one of the one of the key things about these these coefficients here depend on the distribution of individual states implicitly because I'm solving around the current distribution. So I then use the these approximations to the op, to the optimal policies to iterate the economy forward one period, and I get a new distribution. So I get a new distribution of individual states. The new, there's a new sort of steady state level of capital, and there's a new current level of capital. Can you interpret this picture for me? Yeah. So on the, uh, uh, on the left-hand side here, I need to go back. On the left-hand side here, you have the distribution of individual states. Uh, it's on a computer, so I, have, I approximate it using a large but finite number of things. So what's being plotted? So here is the... the the log of the, the the market weights and the log and the uh, the uh, multipliers on the budget constraint. There would also be productivities on that. This sort of essentially how the this is a the spread in consumption, marginal utility of consumption, and this is sort of this is you can think of the the, the value to the planner of extracting a unit of resources from agent I at this point in time. So I have this distribution here, and then there's an associated steady state level of capital. I then approximate the policies, and I get a new distribution, the green. And there's a new steady state level of capital, and there's a new capital. Are we? Yeah. Are you able to say anything about the size of the error when you do this Taylor series approximation? Uh, I, not theoretically, obviously. I, uh, in principle, theoretically, I could say something about the size of the error. I haven't done that yet, but you can compute Euler equation errors. I mean, these are large shocks that are smallish, like point, point one, less than 0.1%. Uh, actually, let me. So this is, I can also, uh, if I could click. So I can also, this is a, a paper that Anmol is going to be presenting next, uh, next to us. So there, we're solving with a finite number of agents, and we can actually solve the global methods uh, using global methods using perturbation and using uh, projection methods. And I can compare the optimal policies when there's a, when there's a, between the two different approaches. So here, I can plot the optimal uh, the optimal tax rate given the shocks. You'll see the, met, uh, the, the the actual model later, and they they pretty much align exactly. And they, no matter where you choose the state, the the sort of the current state to be, 
And it, if I were to actually plot for a fixed point, rather than changing the point of approximation, a fixed point, uh, I, I wish I had them here, but they're quite far off. So the fact that I'm, you change the point of approximation gives you quite accurate uh, uh, approximations to the policy rules and can actually lead to a good approximation to the long run. So this is sort of hinting at a future uh, a result in, in 50 minutes, but the, the, the model we solved there has a slow convergence to an ergodic distribution and just solving a regular perturbation theory would fail in that, in that convergence, but by doing this sort of iterative, you capture that convergence over the long run. So the dotted red line is where the uh, the the global um, the global solution would converge to in this as well. And if I actually plotted the global solution, it would lie right on. So is there any theory behind that? That if you do that, say repeatedly, as the economy evolves, I I, I approximate I, also that the whole part. I, 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 know that I wish I could say right now yes. It's something I'm working on, but. I, I, I think this has been proposed. I think there was an old book by Gregory Chow. I think mm -hmm. he has sort of proposed something similar, to sort of using different points of approximation as a dynamic system evolved. But he had no theory behind it. So. Yeah, I'm well. I'm going to work on it right now. I'm trying. I, I'm applying it to sort of problems I know that works. I can compute the errors associated with the approximation, but I can't like. I don't have I don't have theory. I'm sure I, with some work I could come up with a, a, an example where this would not be a good idea. But this is it does it, there's really this there's not really weirdness in this example where you would expect the sort of the, the you wouldn't expect like, you don't expect the expectations in the future to sort of reach a point where it sort of dramatically changes and the planner would worry about sort of falling into some sort of trap. Here, things are sort of moving slowly over time. So, like the fact that you do this low, sequential local approximations, you have the idea that this is actually a good idea. How much time do I have? You have uh, eleven more minutes. Eleven more minutes. Okay, that's that's good. So I, I'll just go over this quickly. I kind of, so then obviously this is a, a, talk, a conference on expectations, and I was trying to figure out how best to fit into this conference. And <laughs> <laughs> the best I could think about this is why is this, you know, like I've kind of given you hopefully some motivation for this, but like why is this difficult? And the exact reason why is because the agents are thinking about the future. They're thinking about how that distribution is going to evolve and how that's going to affect their future choices. And if they're thinking about how that distribution of, is going to evolve and how that affects their choices, they're going to be thinking about how does a change in the state of one agent <coughs> affect my decisions. So just think, you have 10,000 agents, that's, oh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> That's a hundred million objects. I hope. <laughs> and it gets worse if you do a second order approximation. This is like the, 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 the main simplification I found is essentially if the evolution of the state variables, so how a change in this my state today affects my state tomorrow, is independent of my the agent, then you can actually decompose how uh, the chain, how the distribution affects the individual's actions through aggregates. So it looks like how does agent how does a small change in agent J affect the aggregate prices, and then how do aggregate prices affect me? And this is kind of intuitive if agents aren't forward looking. If agents aren't forward looking, and we look at how the the if we take derivatives of the, uh, the, the, the individual optimality, agent J only enters through the aggregate variables. So you can easily see I could invert this and get how agent, and get, uh, and get exactly something like this. Agent Z affects aggregates, aggregates affect myself. When agents are forward-looking, you get this extra term here, which is problematic. This is 
essentially how changes in the states will affect future decisions. And the key is, if this guy doesn't depend on J, then I can do the exact same procedure. And this actually applies across, uh, this applies as you're taking higher order terms as well. So essentially I decompose I decomposed a complex object, something which depends on two agents, into two things which depend only on one agent. And that gives you, a pro uh, that gives you an, in the end, an algorithm which grows linearly with the number of agents. So I'll quickly go over the results since I don't have a lot of time. So uh, calibration, uh, there's a risk aversion. Uh, discount factor is 0.97, Frisch elasticity is one half, uh, production is going to be decreasing returns to scale. Uh, I choose the level of decreasing returns to scale and the total variance to match the firm size distribution. And the, the key thing is how I'm going to deal with the, uh, the, um, how the, the, the productivities of the uh, the individual firm. So I'm going to choose a, the row close to one, and then choose change the relative variance to change the overall autocorrelation of the process. So what happens? Well, if we have a low level of autocorrelation, capital taxes are low. But as we increase the autocorrelation towards more reasonable levels in the 0 0.7, 0 0.9 range, the capital taxes, capital income tax is high. And to get an idea of where this is coming from, you you can decompose using the first order conditions of the Paris problem the capital tax into two, essentially two terms. One is the, uh, the sort of term which is capturing the redistrib redistribution motive of the planner. You, after all of the lease shops, because the agents are, have incomplete markets, the, uh, the distribution of uh, consumption is going to spread out. The planner is going to want to try and redistribute between these agents. And then there's a sort of a term which is in, capturing the intertemporal efficiency. These are sort of terms which you'll see in A. Gary. And uh, the what just happened? Terms that you will see in something like Iagari. So here's the idea: the redistribution term I can sort of break is the sort of the covariance of two objects. The marginal benefit of extracting resources from the agent I at time t. And the excess returns, the excess capital income relative to the risk-free uh, debt of the agent I at times t. So this is a combination of two terms. You can think about this as a combination of the uh, excess marginal returns and the, uh, the capital income, which is basically allocated to the entrepreneur's own uh, inherent ability. This is coming from the decreasing returns to scale. And as that Covariance increases, the planners, uh, the planner wants to have higher capital taxes. At the same time, we have a sort of efficiency term. So here, this is what we you could see in, in Iagari. There's the I'm comparing the uh, the multiplier for the resource constraint at time t minus one to the multiplier at time t in a steady state because there's uh, it, there's idiosyncratic risk and incomplete markets, R is going to be less than one over beta. So this is going to, uh, sorry, this should be a minus. Yeah, there's a, there's a negative sign there. I apologize. Anyway, this will push you towards a, a, a capital tax. On the other hand, the agents are sort of facing their own risk, which is captured by this term here. So the marginal product of capital, the covariance of the, moder ma the agent's marginal product of capital with its own uh, marginal utilities. And to compensate their risk, they, may, they might undersave. So there's a part of this which is pushing towards oversaving, a part of this which is pushing towards undersaving. With just IID shocks, this term, this term dominates. In the end, we can see that basically the entire cap the, the capital tax is entirely driven by this uh, redistributionary term. So which one is the The blue line, sorry. So the last thing I want to talk about is the labor income tax, because I, I, I found this interesting, because this is sort of the labor income tax which is coming despite no heterogeneity in labor income productivities and large labor income tax. So there's a, I had an ex-ante intuition, which is you have homogeneous labor productivities, right? 
I have given the, the utility function I chose, the agents who are, have low consumption are going to be working hard, are going to be supplying more labor. It's a way they help insure themselves against the shocks. And then it makes sense, the plan that he wants to give resource to these agents, he's going to subsidize labor income. And that happens when you have low, low autocorrelation. But as the autocorrelation increases, the labor tax increases over time, uh, becomes quite large. And we can get an idea of what's happening here. So the, again, we can decompose into a redistribution, something which is I'm going to call bond pricing in a way. So the redistribution is what we saw before, just covariance of labor income with the desire to extract resources from that agent at time t. And this is going to be negative. This is going to push it towards a subsidy. The other term basically compares the marginal value of a unit of consumption to agent I to the marginal value of relaxing the resource constraint. And this pushes towards a tax. So what's going on here is that each individual agent doesn't recognize what happens when, if all the agents increase their labor supply, but the planner does. So let's, say, let's think about having no labor tax. The marginal utility of consumption is going to be exactly equal to the marginal disutility of labor. Now, if the planner subsidizes labor a little bit, he's going to increase the total labor, he's going to increase the total labor supply and increase total consumption. That's going to make the returns on bonds from the previous period larger. And this is a problem where we're getting this distribution of wealth. And the richer agents have more wealth. So while some of the output from the labor supply is going towards the agents, and the agents themselves, a portion of it is going to be paying the increased interest rate on the bonds. And the planner recognizes this. And that's why we're comparing this uh, the, the, this marginal value of an extra unit of resources to the marginal value of consumption. The planner recognizes this and ends up having quite large labor taxes. And this is like, it's not a property of the production function itself. If you get rid of capital in this model, uh, you'll still see something. If you get rid of capital in this model and just have some exogenous uh, endowment stream, you'll, you'll, you'll see this same property. You can see it in a two-agent problem. So basically, what you, the lessons you get from this, capital taxes here are responding to, uh, capital taxes are responding to heterogeneity in productivities across firms, not necessarily heterogeneity in wealth, in financial wealth. Labor taxes are responding to the heterogeneity in financial wealth. So, since I'm basically out of time, uh, that's been studying this optimal taxation problem. There's been sources of risk. I hope they've motivated some of the general computational method I'm working on. And uh, we find that the labor and capital taxes depend significantly with the risk. Uh, I'm also working on some how this economy responds to aggregate shocks. Didn't have time to get to it, but those results are interesting. So, so thank you. <laughs>